Good evening and welcome to uh, uh, this tonight's meeting of the Lakeville Planning Board. This is a continued public hearing uh, tonight, Thursday, February 18th, 2021, being that it's after 7 p.m. I'm calling this meeting to order. This is a continuance of a hearing for the redevelopment of 43 Main Street, uh, which is the former site of the Lakeville Hospital property. And in accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 20, relating to the 2020 novel coronavirus outbreak emergency, February 18, 2021, public meeting of the planning board shall be physically closed to the public to avoid group congregation. However, to view this meeting in progress, please go to facebook.com backslash lake cam not need a fake, uh, Facebook account to view the meeting. This meeting will be recorded and available to be viewed at a later date at www.lakecam.tv backslash. This is also a joint hearing between the Planning Board, Board of Health and the Conservation Commission. At this time, I'd like uh, the Conservation Commission to call their meeting to order. The meeting will come to order. Uh, I'm Bob Bouchard, Chairman of the Commission. Do uh, you want to do a roll call of attendance, Bob? Sure. Uh, let's see, start off with Joseph. Present. Nancy. She was here. She's unmuted. Oh, I see her. Present. Present. Okay. Uh, I don't think anyone else is here. John. I, Josh came. Is Josh yeah. here? Yep. President. I didn't see him. Okay. And uh, myself. And oh, yes, the chairman. <laughs> How do you do? Very good. And yourself. Very good. Uh, thank you, Bob. And now I'd like the Board of Health to call their meeting to order. It's 7 05 on February 18th. And I'd like to call the Board of Health meeting to order. Um, Chris Spratt present. Bob Pellucci. I'm here. And uh, Derek is not going to make it with us because of the weather. He's out plowing. So, but we do have a quorum. And as a side note, the uh, Board of Health has their agent, Edward Cullen, present for the meeting. Um, at this time, I'd like to do a roll call vote for the planning present. board. Um, I have Barbara Mankowski. She's here. Uh, Peter Conroy. Here. Present. Uh, Michelle McEachran. Here. Jack Lynch, he's here, and myself here. So we have a full board for the planning board as well. Um, I'd like to remind everybody to remain muted until they're yielded the floor. Uh, tonight's topics of discussion will include wetlands, grading, stormwater management, erosion control, impacts to the buffer zone, and septic and utilities related to the 43 Main Street redevelopment. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Brittany Gesner from VHB if uh, she has a presentation to give. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, You're everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. All right, so assuming everyone can see that, uh, we'll kick it off with our um, uh, our schedule slide as we kick it off every week and each time we're, we're moving down the list and we're getting pretty close. Um, so public hearing number six, we do have a lot of technical items tonight. Um, I, I won't identify them because Mr. Chairman just went through them and they're, they're listed here, but there's a lot of technical information. So we will uh, we'll run through that in the presentation. Um, and, and just given the, the number of topics tonight, hopefully we can stay on topic with these. Um, and if there are other items we need to follow up on, you know, we can discuss those and, and maybe those can be the topic of, of the hearing in two weeks. Um, so with that, I will pass it off to Sarah French and she's gonna kick it off. We're gonna start with wetlands as well as buffer zone impact. Um, and she'll run through all that and then she'll pass it off to me and I will take us through the remainder of, of tonight's topics. Thanks, Brittany. Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, so for the record, Sarah French, I'm a wetland scientist with VHB. 
Um, so I just wanna chat a little bit, um, just do another overview of the wetland resource um, resources that are on the site. Um, so we have a total of four wetland resource areas on or within close proximity to the site. Wetlands one, two, and three were delineated in April of 2020. And then upon third party review um, completed by environmental partners, we delineated wetland four, which consists of Rush Pond and an associated BBW, BBW located off the property to the west of the project. Um, that was delineated in December of 2020. Um, wetlands two and three are small isolated wetlands to the north of the project. They're non-jurisdictional. Um, so they're also not impacted at all by the projects. So not gonna focus too much on the wetlands two and three. Um, wetland one is a large freshwater system. Um, it includes a mix of palestrian, scrub, shrub, and forested habitats. Um, some of the typical vegetation found in wetland one includes sweet pepper bush, high bush blueberry, um, red maple, the buffer area around wetland one shows, shows a lot of signs of previous disturbance, um, consists of a lot of invasive plant species. Some of those include oriental bittersweet, Japanese knotweed, and Japanese barberry. Um, we also have the, the solid waste disposal area, um, which encroaches into the northern part of wetland one, um, with a lot of visible debris within the wetland, including tires, concrete, assorted, and um, assorted metal appliances. There's also um, a certified vernal pool associated with wetland one. We flagged that vernal pool in the field based on the mean annual high water mark. Um, the green hatching on the plans show the extent of the certified vernal pool. Um, we've reviewed all these wetland resource areas, including the location of the certified vernal pool with environmental partners, who is third party reviewer for the town. Um, we're in agreement with their location and completeness of their delineations. So Brittany, if you wanna um, jump to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the certified vernal pool and vernal pool habitat. So under the Wetlands Protection Act, under 310 CMR 1004, vernal, vernal pool habitat is defined as a confined basin depressions, which at least in most years, hold water for a minimum of two continuous months during the spring and or summer and which are free of adult fish populations, as well as the areas within 100 feet of the mean annual boundaries of such depressions, to the extent that such habitat is within an area subject to protection under the Mass Massachusetts General Law um, C-131 Section 40, which basically says that our certified vernal pool and 100 foot vernal pool habitat is just within um, wetland one, that jurisdictional resource area, it does not extend beyond that. Um, so our project related impacts are proposed, um, are proposed, are not proposed within any wetland resource areas or vernal pool, vernal pool habitats, just except for the removal of the solid waste disposal area. Um, the removal of the solid waste disposal area within the adjacent um, and adjacent to the pool will really be an overall improvement to the adjacent habitat. Um, and also upon review with the um, environmental partners, the third party reviewer, um, we have moved stormwater features um, and those are now relocated to fall outside of the 100 foot setback, which is a requirement of the Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook. Um, Brittany, if you wanna to jump to the next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about the work within the buffer zone. So we'll have, Installation of our, our erosion controls. Brittany's gonna discuss that a little bit more in detail um, later in the presentation. So of approximately 14 acres of the new impervious surfaces that are being constructed as part of the full project, we have just about 0.63 acres that will be located within the buffer zone to wetland one. That will be for the construction of the circulation driveway, which is shown here in that kind of orangey um, coral color, along with um, the approximately 570 linear foot retaining wall, which is shown to the east of that in pink. Some of the other minor activities associated with the project within the buffer zone of wetland one and four include regrading and landscaping activities. There will be some temporary disturbance to the buffer zone of wetland one associated with the removal of the solid waste disposal area as well. Um, so that brings us to the associated work within wetland one as part of the solid waste removal efforts. 
Um, so of the, um, as part of the removal of the solid waste disposal area, we have approximately 510 square feet of direct wetland impacts to wetland one. All of the work within the resource area will be completed by hand. Machines will not be allowed to enter the wetlands. Um, and we're actually in coordination um, right now with obtaining permits from the Mass DEP under the 401 water quality regulations, as well as under section 404 with the US Corm uh, Army Corps of Engineers for the work within wetland one. Um, because it's a certified, there's a certified runoff pool, the, the wetland is considered an outstanding resource water. Um, so we're, we're in coordination with those two, two agencies as well. Um, as mentioned earlier, the removal of the solid waste disposal area within and adjacent to the resource area and vernal pool will, will really be an overall improvement um, for the adjacent habitat. The wetland impacts will be mitigated with a one-to-one -one restoration of the resource area and the entire area will be fully restored upon completion of the work. Um, so Brittany, if you want to jump to the next slide. So I've included some photos of the solid waste disposal area um, adjacent to wet, wetland one. So as you can see, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of debris. There's a lot of um, tires, cans, um, you know, uh, metal appliances, old refrigerators, that sort of thing that have been dumped into this area um, that we're gonna just be carefully pulling out um, and restoring that, that wetland one um, edge. So Brittany, if you wanna jump to the next slides, we'll talk a little bit about wetland, the wetland restoration efforts. So the restoration, as I mentioned, that'll include removal of the debris um, and the solid waste from the wetlands. We'll pull all of that out and then place um, about probably about 12 inches of wetland soil or as needed to match the existing grade. Um, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll, we'll mimic, we'll, we'll put the topography, um, we'll grade it out so that it kind of mimics a natural wetland. And, you know, it won't be kind of a straight um, smooth over area. Um, we'll, we'll kind of make it hummocky and, and try and match the existing um, wetland features. Um, that, that area will then be seeded with a wetland seed mix. Um, I know there were some, a comment from environmental partners about um, a planting plan. I know that we're still um, in coordination with the landscape ar architect, and I think um, that would be fine to include um, a planting plan for that buffer zone um, area. But really the, the wetland area itself is such a kind of small area that I think a wetland seed mix would suffice. Um, we'll also be collecting fallen logs um, and branches, other natural woody debris that'll be saved for placing in the restored area um, and the buffer area to provide beneficial wildlife habitat. Um, as I mentioned, all work will be performed from the uplands. No machinery will be allowed to enter the wetlands. Um, we'll be using all proper BMPs, um, in, which will include silt fence, um, straw wattle, as you can see in the little um, figure, we we'll use silt fence straw wattle um, that'll be installed at the bottom of the slope, erosion control fabric as needed during the duration of the project, um, just to limit erosion and silt from entering the wetlands. Um, and all BMPs will remain in place until the site is fully stable. All the work will be supervised by a wetland scientist, um, and the client is also committed to the restoration area being monitored by a wetland scientist for at least two growing seasons, or really that's specified by the regulatory agency. So once we coordinate with Mass DEP and um, Army Corps, we'll see what, what they have to say. Um, so to summarize quickly, no project related impacts within any wetland resource areas or vernal pool or vernal pool habitat, only except for the removal of that 510 square feet of the solid waste disposal area. Um, and we really feel that this is a, an overall improvement um, to the ecological integrity and health of the area. Um, and the remaining project activities are solely located within that 100 foot buffer, um, buffer zone, um, resulting in no direct impacts. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back over to Brittany. Excellent, thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah.
Um, and before I take us into the, the next topics, I did want to mention, um, as, as Sarah already alluded to, we did receive the, the peer review letter um, from environmental partners on all of the topics that we're discussing tonight. Um, we've reviewed it in, in some detail and we are in general agreements with um, all of their comments. We, we, they're mostly technical in nature, some construction details or, or providing some additional documentation. Um, so we're pulling together the formal response on that now and we, we look forward to submitting that in the coming days. However, there's nothing that jumped out at me um, that it, we, we strongly disagree with or, or that would trigger um, significant changes to the design. Um, so I'll touch on some of that, but I just wanted to uh, preface that we did receive that and um, it, it seems like we, we can resolve any of the comments that were identified. Thank you. Um, so moving on, um, moving on into site grading. Um, we have discussed really all of these topics. We, we've touched on them as part of our many prior hearings, but tonight we'll focus in on grading a bit. Um, as we've mentioned, the, the site, although it is heavily vegetated right now, it, it has been widely disturbed. There's, there's aerial images, you know, dating back to the 60s that just show the entire site is completely cleared. Um, so the, the site has been heavily disturbed. Um, and really the existing topography is indicative of that. It, it was built up um, where these existing buildings are shown in orange. Um, in the front of the site where the buildings are, are the highest elevation on site um, with the highest point at 125. And then it really slopes down in all directions, um, you know, towards Main Street, which is at elevation 92. Uh, Wetland one is at elevation 80, uh, Rush Pond Road 91. Uh, or 94, excuse me, and Rhode Island Road 91. So we're really at this, this high point in the middle and everything slopes down in all directions. Um, and at the perimeter of the site, it really is fairly flat. So there is no screening under existing conditions. You can see right in, you can see the existing buildings, you can see the existing parking lots, which are in very close proximity to the property line on the west side. Um, so really the, this rolling topography that was very widely disturbed um, throughout the 1900s. So what we're proposing um, is to, to take that rolling topography and, and flatten it out a bit. Um, we'll take some of those very high points at the front of the site and push them towards the back to allow us to, to install this flat building. Um, however, we are able to tie into the existing grades around the entire perimeter of the site. Um, and that includes the, the berms that we'll be providing around the perimeters that we've, we've discussed in a lot of detail. Um, but rather than how the existing buildings today really sit up high on a knoll, um, this proposed building will not be sitting up nearly as high as the existing buildings do. Um, we have been in coordination that dog leg at the, the lower right hand side of the site, you can see our, our property line is very thin there. Um, there is a, a, an approved project to the, the left of that dog leg and there's an, an imminent development project uh, or a, a development project that will be submitted to the town imminently for approvals. We've been coordinating with both of those developments um, to ensure that the grading of our site, you know, makes sense with the grading of their site. So in addition to coordinating with all the residential abutters, we are doing our best to be a good neighbor with the, um, the, the other developments in town as well. Um, all of the, the proposed pavement grades will be less than 5%. Um, and there are accessible parking spaces and all of the pedestrian routes will be in compliance with ADA and AAB requirements as far as the grading of them. Um, and all of the landscape grades are either less than three to one or in specific locations, they are as steep as two to one, which will be uh, specific NOMO areas. And that, those allow us to make the berms as high as we are making them um, at the front, the rear, and the, the left side of the site. Um, and the, the overall intent of the site grading is to balance earthworks. We don't want to be exporting a whole bunch of earth off the site. We don't want to be importing. It doesn't make sense financially and it doesn't make sense um, environmentally. We want to keep the, the soil that's there. We want to keep it on site. We want to reuse it. Um, so that we've done a, a very detailed analysis of the proposed grading in comparison to the existing grading um, to do what we can to ensure that this is as balanced of a site as possible. Of course, some materials will need to leave the site, the landfill, for example, um, you know, in, in the buildings because those are contaminated with asbestos. Um, 
And we will need to bring some new materials on site, asphalt, concrete, um, utilities, for example. But beyond the, the specific needs, the intent really is to keep the material that's there, there, um, and to balance it best we can. So with that, I will transition into stormwater management. Um, the, the proposed project has been designed um, in accordance with the stormwater management handbook that's been issued by uh, MassDEP. And so under existing conditions, um, we modeled in terms of stormwater management, we had a 43 acre study area. Um, and the way that you, you model stormwater is you need to identify design points, the locations around the entirety of the site where stormwater flows off of the site um, under existing conditions. So there are nine existing design points for this project and those are um, identified by the red symbols around the site. And so we modeled uh, the, the different contributing areas under existing conditions to each of these nine design points. Um, it's important to note that, you know, there is a, a failing stormwater infrastructure system at the front of the site associated with the, the building and the, um, the, the parking lot. It is a failing system. It is a system that's very old and not compliant with the stormwater standards and is a system that does connect to MassDOT's uh, drainage system in uh, Main Street, which is not in compliance with MassDOT's current policy. Um, and then the remainder of the site in the back of the site really flows by overland um, into the wetlands. Under proposed conditions, um, we analyze the site in the same exact manner. So we use the same exact nine design points and we look at the contributing areas under proposed conditions. And then we install what are called uh, best management practices, BMPs, um, to capture detain, treat, and infiltrate the stormwater management before it leaves the site and um, reaches those design points. Um, we also have included a swale on the left-hand side of the site to help capture stormwater runoff from that berm, help keep that stormwater on our site um, and not discharge towards the neighbors. As far as the uh, proposed drainage piping on the site, we have sized that to convey the 10 year storm event. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna walk through the 10 stormwater standards. I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, so the first stormwater standard is that uh, no, no new untreated discharges or erosion to wetlands. And the way that our, I'm actually gonna back up just one second. So while we're looking at this, before I jump into the standards, the, the BMPs that we've proposed on the site, um, in these purple areas, there's two uh, infiltration basins. So those all collect stormwater and they fully infiltrate. We actually do not have any discharges over the berms or out of those basins, they are all designed to fully infiltrate for the modeled storms. So there's two bur purple basins, one at the top and one over on the right-hand side of the site. At the front of the site, this green area, that's a, a gravel wetland. Um, that is a stormwater BMP that is not designed to infiltrate stormwater, but it's des designed to detain and treat stormwater, stormwater at the front of the site. We've also proposed deep sump hooded catch basins, and there is um, one hydrodynamic separator at the front of the site, um, the very bottom left-hand corner. That captures a very small percentage of runoff, um, and it does continue to discharge into Main Street, MassDOT's system, but it is significantly smaller than the existing discharge, um, and it is too low to retain onto our site. So that is something we'll be coordinating directly with MassDOT on. I just wanted to point out these BMPs because I will be referencing them uh, as I walk through the, the various standards. Um, so standard one, uh, no new untreated discharges to wetlands. So as I mentioned, those two purple infiltration basins, so ha those have been designed to fully recharge all of the stormwater that is getting to them. So we will not have point discharges from our site towards the wetlands. Additionally, all of our stormwater outfalls will be designed with riprap aprons that have been sized for the 100 year storm. Peak rate attenuation, standard two. 
so this standard really looks at those nine design points that I previously referenced that are located all around the site. And we analyze them for the two year, the 10 year and the 100 year storm. And what this allows us to do is ensure that the peak rate of stormwater runoff from our site will not increase during any one of these modeled storms to any one of the design points. And so you can see here for each of the design points from existing to proposed, our peak rate of runoff is significantly being reduced. I would say the 100 year storm is, is the one where you can see that reduction the most. And that is because we are infiltrating so much of the runoff um, at those two, those two infiltration basins. Um, so this standard three is stormwater recharge. Um, because our infiltration basins are so large, we are actually recharging um, five, more than five times the required recharge volume per, per the stormwater standards. Um, so that, that's a great story as far as recharging the aquifer. Um, Additionally, we are we do have a, a drainage piping that collects roof runoff only. It is not commingled with um, parking lot runoff. And so we are proposing those pipes that have the clean roof runoff only to be perforated mm -hmm. pipes. Um, this site has very sandy soils and very low groundwater. So that will allow some of the roof runoff to recharge directly into the groundwater um, and avoid the, the stormwater management system we've designed. That said, to be conservative, we've excluded the perforated pipes from the, the design. Um, however, we, we believe that a lot of the stormwater will recharge from those pipes. Um, our, all, one of our infiltrative BMPs, our, our infiltration basin, is more than four feet above groundwater. The other one is two feet above groundwater and we have provided a, a mounding analysis to demonstrate that that will still infiltrate. And we have also located all of our infiltrative BMPs um, outside of the 100 foot buffer zone from the certified vernal pool in accordance with the stormwater management standards. And all of the basins have been designed to drain within 72 hours. Standard four is water quality. So we have a couple of treatment trains that we're proposing. Um, standard four requires that we remove total suspended solids from stormwater, 80% um, of total suspended solids, and then 44% prior to reaching the infiltrative BMPs. Um, so the three treatment trains that we're proposing on the site, stormwater will go to a deep sump hooded catch basin, be then directed to a sediment four bay, and then infiltrated. The second one is deep sump hooded catch basin to a sediment four bay and then that gravel wetland at the front of the site. And then the third one is the hydrodynamic separator. And that again is just because that, that very small area is, is so low, we just could not get it back to one of our basins. Um, standard five, our site is considered um, a LUPL. This stands for land use of higher potential pollution potential load. Um, it's really due to the industrial nature of the site. And because of that, um, all of our BMPs have been sized to treat the one inch water quality volume as opposed to the half inch. So that's the larger volume that we're, we're designing for. Um, in addition to that, we do have discharges to a uh, critical area, and that is wetland one is an outstanding resource water because it does contain the certified vernal pool. And again, that requires us to um, treat at least the one inch water quality volume prior to discharge. And standard seven redevelopment, we do consider this project a redevelopment just because the site has been so previously disturbed um, and is really in, in failing repair throughout. However, um, it is not considered a redevelopment under the stormwater management standards because we are increasing impervious area on the site. Um, and we've, we've designed the entire site, at least from a stormwater management perspective, that this is new development and we're not taking credit for any of the existing um, failing development out there. Standard eight, um, construction period pollution prevention and erosion and sedimentation controls. I do have another slide coming up later on that I'll touch on this in a little bit more detail, but I do wanna touch on it now because it is one of the stormwater management standards. Um, this project will be subject to the EPA uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Construction General Permit. So what that means is that this project will be subject to what is known as a SWIP 
a stormwater pollution prevention plan. That will need to be created at, it created and submitted to the EPA at least two weeks before construction begins. And that is a live living document that must be maintained and updated throughout the entirety of construction. Um, that will be the responsibility of the contractor and the developer. Um, however, the, as a civil engineer, we will provide guidance and um, we can help them with the support and the upkeep of that SWIP. Um, but that will be a, a live living document that will be maintained and kept on site throughout the entirety of construction. Um, we did include some of the content that will be included in the SWIP in the submission materials. However, that will be, as I mentioned, prepared and, and submitted to the EPA uh, two weeks prior to the beginning of construction. Um, standard nine is long-term operation and maintenance plan. Um, so the, the developer is committed to long-term operations and maintenance of the site and the stormwater management system. This does include source control, spill prevention, snow management, maintenance of the stormwater management systems and reporting and documentation. So we have submitted an, an operation maintenance plan um, that outlines what each of these items would look like in the long term of maintaining the site once construction is complete. And finally, standard 10. Um, standard 10 just discusses the separation of sanitary sewer from storm drainage. This is, uh, the project has been designed to have separate sanitary sewer and storm drainage systems and all of the existing infrastructure from the prior development will be completely removed as part of the project. So as I mentioned, I, I do wanna dive in a little bit deeper to erosion and sedimentation control. Um, this is a very large site um, and erosion sedimentation control will be a very big component throughout the entirety of construction. Um, as I mentioned, there will be a SWIP prepared and that will be um, maintained throughout the entirety of construction. Um, some of the, and all of the erosion and sedimentation control features will be described in detail as far as how to install them, how to maintain them, how to inspect them. That will be all documented within the SWIP. Some of the BMPs that we are proposing are straw wattle and silt fence. That will be placed around the entire limits of disturbance. Um, originally, we were only proposing the silt fence within the 100 foot buffer zone to the wetlands. However, uh, as a result of the peer review process, um, we've changed that to provide straw wattle and silt fence around the entirety of the project. Um, the silt fence will help serve as um, you know, a visual barrier to the limits of construction. Silt sacks will be placed in all online catch basins, um, existing or proposed for as long as they are online um, to the drainage system. There'll be a temporary crushed stone construction exit. Um, so that will help remove some of the, the dirt and sediment that, that gets onto the vehicles that'll help remove it before they, they leave the site. Um, all disturbed soils, they will be stabilized if any activity on the site is ceased for more than 14 days or any areas of activity um, is ceased for 14 days. There'll be temporary sedimentation basins um, and, the, and the same thing with stockpiles, those will also be stabilized <coughs> if those are stored and, and left stagnant for more than 14 days on the site. All right, shifting gears. So um, shifting gears into the septic system. Um, as I, most of you are aware, there is no public sewer provided in Main Street. Accordingly, we have designed and are proposing an on-site septic system for waste, uh, wastewater disposal. Um, the proposed system has been designed in accordance with 310 CMR 15. This is also known as Title V. Um, you can see here on the image, uh, there's two purple rectangles. Those are the locations of the soil absorption systems we're proposing. And then um, the purple lines indicate the gravity sewer collection system. And then this will be a pumped system. Um, so it'll all be collected and then pumped up to the soil absorption systems. There are no public water wells within 400 feet of the soil absorption systems. And there are no private wells within 100 feet of the system. 
I would note that those two bolts are there just because that's the requirement. Um, there is much more distance between the system and those wells. Um, for example, I think the closest private water well is more than is about 250 feet away. Um, the system has been designed conservatively. Um, we've assumed one person per 1,000 square feet. So that results in, we've assumed 403 employees at the site. Um, and we've assumed uh, 15 gallons per day. That is the rate assuming that there is no cafeteria in this building, um, which currently is not being proposed. And to the best of my knowledge, I, I don't believe that that is anticipated. If the cafeteria is anticipated at any point in the future, these calculations will need to be reassessed and we'll have to come back to the Board of Health accordingly. Um, so the system has been designed for 6,045 gallons per day. And as I mentioned previously, it is a pressure dose system in accordance with Title V. Um, a little bit more about the design of the system. So we are proposing two soil absorption systems. Um, that's two areas with 13 trenches each and there are reserve areas in between each of the trenches. Um, seven test pits and two perk tests were completed and observed both by VHB and the Lakeville Board of Health, um, some in September and some this past January. Um, we are proposing the soil absorption systems more than 12 feet above groundwater. Um, and the, the minimum separation per Title V is four feet. All right, my last slide tonight, we're getting there. So site utilities, the remainder of the utilities, water, electric, and natural gas. So water, there is public water um, in Main Street, and we are proposing to connect to the water main that is owned and maintained by the city of Taunton. We are proposing one connection in Main Street on that left curb cut, the southern curb cut, um, and the, the water main will loop the building. Um, we are proposing nine fire hydrants around the site. This will allow one hydrant to be within 250 feet of all exterior points in the building. We have re reviewed and discussed this in detail with the fire department. Um, additionally, electric service will be brought to Main Street and we are proposing an emergency generator on the property. And then also natural gas does exist in Main Street as well. So both of those will be connections um, at the frontage of the site into the site. And so with that, that will complete uh, our formal presentation tonight, but we are more than happy to engage in further discussion and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Um, so at this time, I'd just like to mention a few submittals that uh, the boards have received. Uh, the first one I think you referenced, Brittany, was uh, Environmental Partners Peer Review Letter dated February 12th, 2021. Uh, then we also received an IBI group letter for the uh, landscape design, I guess it is, uh, from February 10th. Uh, we received Mass DOT documentation, uh, Appendix B, transportation supporting documents, uh, memorandum to Matt Keeley that I believe you supplied or VHB supplied to, I think that's part of MEPA and you were so gracious to give it to the town. Uh, that was a tough one to read. A lot of, a lot of graphs and numbers. Uh, we received a submittal from uh, Mrs. Spieler at 10 Valley Road. Uh, Mr. Scott has provided some documentation uh, that was Town of Lakeville documentation dated March 16th from uh, Rita Garbett, Town Administrator at the time. Uh, another document, January 26th, 2012, also Rita Garbett. Uh, a sample warrant language. Uh, Town of Lakeville list of tasks related to the Chapter 43D program. Uh, there was also some correspondence from Mr. Scott. Uh, it was basically an email chain between him and a sound engineer named Robert Andrus. Uh, and then there was also um, another memorandum from Environmental Partners. Um, related to trip calculations, which we're not gonna get into tonight. Um, at this time, 
I'd like to, uh, per their request, turn over the hearing to the Board of Health. I think uh, they may have some short time with us tonight. And if they'd like to talk about the septic or utilities that's related to their purview. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, most of my comments that I already had were addressed in um, Scott Turner's letter from Environmental Partners. Um, so I'll pass it off to my fellow board member and then our health agent to talk about any of their issues with it. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, did you go over those two things Derek brought up with them already or were you gonna bring it up tonight? So some of the stuff is already addressed in the, in the Environmental Partners letter as far mm -hmm. as the, um, the depth of the septic tanks. And Brittany had already mentioned that they were addressing that stuff. So I was just gonna bring up, you know, if there's anything additional to um, what Environmental Partners had already brought up. I know Ed has one thing about uh, the light posts, uh, but I don't know if you had anything in addition to that, Bob. No, not since our meeting the other night when we talked about it. I'm good with everything we talked about. Okay. All right. Ed, do you want to bring up um, things that you found? Yeah. Basically, as you said, um, most of the stuff we were in agreement with uh, environmental partners as well. The one thing um, we felt they missed was we have a local bylaw that says there's no structures allowed within five feet of a septic component. And those light posts are within five feet of the septic field. So it's, yeah, I think they're three feet away. So it, it just be a matter of sliding the, the field over two, two to three feet, not a big deal. Okay, we can, we can take care of that. Um, Brittany, would you like to speak to any of the comments specific? I know you don't have a, a written rebuttal to environmental partners letter, but it's a short section while we have the Board of Health. Would you like to comment on anything back to the EPs? Comments. I don't think so at this point. We we really okay. didn't have um, any major concerns. If if we do, I, I would just ask if if it's okay. You know, maybe we follow up email or, or separately, and we can just identify if we have any questions or, or concerns about our ability to respond to them. Um, but at, at this point, based on our initial review, um, it, it seemed like we could address them all. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, and I think Ed, that was all you had, right? Correct. I didn't have anything else. All right. Um, Scott, did you want to add anything to your letter or comment? Um, I don't have anything additional. You know, I, I am a little bit concerned about that one hole that showed all fill. Right. So, That's one thing that we discussed, and I figured we'd probably go back and forth with that. Okay. Um, BHB has had time to go through the whole um, preview letter and we can discuss uh, going forward that. I think maybe new test holes or um, maybe sh sliding the field a little bit, maybe. But those are things that can be discussed as the, we go through the letter. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess I can respond. To, I'm sorry. I was going to say I can respond to that one comment now if you'd like. Um, it, our interpretation of it is that there are test pits on, on three sides. Of, of that one, which confirm that natural soils exist at lower elevations. Um, and, and on the remaining side, there are very large mature, mature trees. So we, we truly believe this is an isolated condition. Um, and we do know on the plan to, to remove and replace that fill extending down to naturally occurring soil. Um, so it, it, it very much appeared to us to be an isolated condition. Um, I don't know how, how you guys feel about that. No, I, I would agree with that. Odds are at some point they needed some good material over there and they dug a hole and they just put whatever they had on the site back in it. So yeah, as long as that gets opened up and it gets confirmed by the engineer that you know he's dug it out far enough to good material, I'm okay with it. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I think it's just, it's very representative of what we've seen across the site that you know, things have been very widely disturbed um, and it's likely a very isolated situation. Yeah, and I think that's what we we probably would be addressing it at open hole or, because, and it might not be the only place here to encounter it, like you said. Where Fair enough, so yep. just, There's been so much disturbance out there, you know, over what, a hundred years, yep. right? So, 
Um, mm -hmm. The one other thing too, with the depth of the tanks, um, that would require a, a variance application, I believe, if that was to stay. Okay, we'll take a we'll take a look at that and, and circle back on it. All right. Um, Before you move on, Chris, could you continue this? And I don't like to run out on people, but ever since Corona, I can't put multiple guys in a truck. So I have become uh, this year, I'm back out in the truck with my son doing some snow and sand. And so um, yeah, that's I can't what I was... wait till I can put them both in the same truck again. So I don't have to do it. But for this year, I need to get going. I was just going to ask if there's anything else, then I was going to suggest that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, does anyone else have anything that board health related that anyone want to speak to? All right. Well, hearing none, I will uh, continue our board health meeting to um, our next meeting, which is on the schedule. I don't think we're on the next. Uh, I don't have the schedule right it, in front of me. Could you keep it on our schedule, which would be March 4th? March 4th, right. So I'll continue to March 4th. I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Bob Bellucci? Aye. Chris Spratt? Aye. Okay, so your motion carries with the majority. Yep. And we will see you guys on March 4th. Do you want to uh, officially adjourn your hearing? Well, you I'm going to hang around. around. Even if you stick around, Chris? Yeah, we, gotta, we still got to adjourn it, though. I'll make yeah. a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, guys. Me and Jerry. All right. Have a good one, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Um, okay, so the, your, the Board of Health motion carried, and they have voted to continue for the record until March 4th, and they have adjourned their hearing tonight. Uh, so moving on, uh, I, I guess I'd like to, at this point, turn the hearing over to the Conservation Commission. Um, a lot of the... Uh, Agenda items tonight are more related to CONCOM. So, uh, Chairman Bouchard, would you like to step in? Bob, Bob you're muted. There you go. Is that better? I thought I was being smart and muting it earlier so that you would hear any more, more commotion. Um, no, I'm quite, quite satisfied with some of the, the things that we provide, uh, we've been provided with so far. Um, we've, we talked a, a few things over earlier this week. Uh, I think both Joe, um, Joe and Nancy may have had some comments they wanted to interject. So uh, now's, now's the chance. I see uh, Joe's hand up. He's, uh, he's muted also. I get a couple of questions. Uh, looking at the letter from environmental partners, um, number one, there's some offsite grading near Rush Pond itself. Do we know how far separation from the buffer zone to that pond this grading will go? Yep, I, I can speak to that. Um, the, the grading within the buffer zone uh, adjacent to Rush Pond, I don't think it's even 10 feet within the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, I, I, I think so that would probably keep us about 90 feet away from Rush Pond. Um, that's a very a steep slope and heavily yep. wooded. And yep. so the intent is we're trying to maintain that that wooded steep slope. Okay, uh, number three on that letter. There's a drainage swale that the environmental partners said should have a detail. It kind of wasn't clear exactly the shape of it or where it went. Yep, uh, we will add details for the drainage swale to, to our next set of drawings. That's the one between the proposed berm and the, abut and the abutting properties? Correct, yep. That's one. Okay, uh, when we get to stormwater, let me scroll to stormwater here. Uh, number... Number three, uh, the letter from environmental partners mentioned that the less efficient calculations of uh, SB2 test pit one should be used for the calculations instead of the one that was mostly all sand as opposed to the one that was sandy loam. 
Yep, we uh, we saw that. We're going to look into that. Um, I, I think we that basin has some flexibility, so I, I think we may just go ahead and use the lower infiltration rate. However, if we find that there's issue, well, if we find there's issues, we'll explore that. Um, but we we feel comfortable that we can address that um, in a manner that that environmental partners will will accept. Okay. Uh, item eight A on that same letter, a SWIP for. Uh, Pollution prevention, uh, has that been filed that goes to DEP? I mean, uh, the, the EPA? That will be prepared. It has not been prepared yet. Yeah, it okay. will be prepared and submitted to the EPA at least two weeks prior to earth disturbance. Same number, 8C. Uh, the bottom of all the infiltration uh, structures are very important because if they get compacted or the wrong material gets in, they're just really not going to work. Uh, it definitely, there are plans that when you when you're building those, that that bottom layer should be as as permeable as possible. Yep, and we can we can actually call out for those to be staked in the field. Um, and I believe we have notes, but if we don't, we can add them. That will um, indicate for heavy machinery to stay out of those areas, um, and and for there to be no construction period sedimentation basins in those areas. Um, and th there's a few other notes we can add to the plans to ensure the protection of those areas during construction. Okay, and we skip down to additional stormwater management comments on the. Same letter from environmental partners, number four, the solid waste disposal area infiltration basin. Uh, do we have details on that somewhere? Um, again, yeah. we want the good material to be in the bottom there somewhere. Correct. And, and what's interesting with that solid waste disposal area, there is actually um, some peats and some clay material below yeah. it. Um, and so our plans do call to over excavate. So they're gonna pull out the solid waste disposal area and then they're also going to pull out those clay peat materials and replace it with sand. Um, so that's been called out and that has been a cost that has been assumed in the, the construction costs. Last item, number nine, uh, about the side slopes for the gravel wetland. Uh, environmental partners suggested a change in the slope uh, so the drainage plan shows the slope draining away from the driveway. Uh, environmental partners suggested the plan be adjusted and the HydroCAD model, it, 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 just the HydroCAD model is needed. Was that actually because you guys tried to increase the berm height, Brittany? Right. Because of the landscape plan? Oh, I'm sorry, I was reading number nine. You said number, is it number eight? No, it's, it's he number jumped nine. forward a section. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's on uh, additional stormwater management controls, number nine. Because that's going to be very visible. So number nine, where it says we recommend side slopes for the gravel wetland. Right, is, right. is that what you're reading? Yes, because that's, oh, going yes. Be, that's going to be very visible. That's right there on Main Street. So it, it says we recommend. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, we could. That is why it was steepened. Yes, for the berm. Um, so, so I we'll think, need to take a detailed look at that or go ahead, Mark. Well, I, I, we can't infight with our own conditions, I think. And I think at that point we have to decide uh, how to make both work, you know, because one cancels out the other. Uh, and the appearance is very important for Main Street. And I sort of think that was Joe's point, but I also think you know, making it work is, and main, being able to maintain it is important as well. So. So we can, we can take a look and see if there's the room there to flatten them to three to one, how it's a very tight space. So it may cause us to lower the height of the berms a little bit, but to your point that may allow for that, a better that. maintenance condition. So if you're amenable to a little bit of a lower berm height, um, that would help us flatten it to a three to one. I think we're concerned with function more than appearance. Excellent. That's all I had. All right, good, thank you. Uh, Nancy, did you have something? I think you, you had uh, mentioned uh, maybe something about the order of conditions. Um, well, I, I'm anxious for to see 
how um, all these things from environmental partners are answered, hopefully in writing that we can look at and make sure they're all addressed before we have to make a decision. There's a lot of things. One that stands out to me the most is the stormwater system pipes. It's under additional stormwater management comments. Number two, that the pipes are sized for a 10 year storm. And um, again, because of all the things in planning we're doing about flooding, um, it says that uh, Lakeville's rules and regulations of the planning board require the pipes be sized for a 25 year storm. But I assume that's one of the things you're gonna answer when you answer all the rest of these comments from environmental partners. I would actually prefer to discuss that that specific one now um, because okay. that, that is a requirement of the subdivision standards. It's not necessarily a requirement for private development. So we would ask for at your discretion if that's something that you know you would you would require um, an upsizing of the pipes on, on the private development. Um, so I guess that would be something I would be looking for clarity from you guys on. So if I could add um, the rationale behind that statement. In many municipalities, and I don't know exactly what the policy is in Lakeville, but in many municipalities, they require the same pipe sizing for private site development as um, they require in subdivision rules and regulations. That being said, a lot of municipalities have the 10 year you know, size their subdivision, they're piping for their subdivisions to the 10 year storm. So I agree with Brittany. I think it's something that um, you folks need to, uh, or the you know the boards need to to decide on. And I don't know what your your typical policy is. If you do require sites to size pipes consistent with the subdivisions sizing. Okay, I mean we'll certainly take that under advisement. I think you know this is a unique situation where we're dealing with. Concom and planning board in the same room. Uh, we would probably, to some extent, rely on expert uh, calculations, whether it be VHB and or yourself. Uh, I guess I would ask you, Scott, is the, the larger pipe for the 25 year storm uh, really a belt and suspenders overbuild or is it? A concern. So it is more a, a lot of times I'll make comments to make sure that you are being, uh, the boards are being consistent with prior policy and not get yourself into a situation where you're <coughs> arbitrarily making a, a waiver or variance where you, you wouldn't otherwise for another project. Um, just to give yourselves a little bit of context, the 10 year storm is typically around four and a half inches. 90% of all storms in Massachusetts are less than an inch of rain. So, you know, occasionally you may get a storm once every 25 years that you're, you're going to get pipe, um, you're gonna reach your pipe capacity, but it's not, it, it won't be very often. Um, I think that 10 year is a reasonable way to size pipes. I just, um, when I made the comment, I was not aware of how you typically handle site plans as they relate to the subdivision rules and regulations. And, and I, you know, perhaps you, perhaps you don't uh, typically um, ask for them to be consistent, um, but I think 25 years, they're big pipes. I think in most cases, the pipes will probably stay the same size. There may be a couple areas where your larger pipes may increase. It adds a little bit of cost to the project. All right. Well, I, I, I think we'll definitely take that into consideration and think about it. Um, but I don't think that we have a standard okay. per se where we do. And this is a unique site for anything that's been done in Lakeville. We can't compare this to a subdivision or another commercial or industrial development in town. It's, it's entirely unique to itself. So we'll probably would handle it on its own basis anyway. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I if I may just add two other points for your consideration on that go item. Ahead. Um, one item, I do think it's worth noting that 
none of our stormwater management system will be discharging to any town of Lakeville stormwater drainage collection system. It will all be handled on site um, with the exception of, my apologies, I'm mistaken. There is a component of the, there is a component on the front of the site that does discharge, um, but that is after the gravel wetland and there is significant um, retention before discharging to the, the town system. The other point that I, I do wanna make is that um, our, our site has been designed with significant over, overland flow relief. So the building sits up high and actually higher than the site. And on both long sides, it's four feet higher than the site. And in the front and the back, uh, the parking lots slope away from the building um, at a, a significant rate. So if by chance the there was a very, a uh, heavy storm, which as Scott referred to would happen, you know, likely every once every 25 years um, and the pipes could not handle it, that ponding would be isolated surrounding the catch basins. And then once the pipes empty out, the, it would go ahead and drain. We, we don't feel that any ponding that would occur on the site would um, go into the building or go off site and, and hurt any abutting properties. So I think just considering the, the site conditions um, and how high the building is compared to the site, um, you should take that into account. Yep, we will. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, do you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, related to some of the things we've discussed so far. And my question is, has there been any consideration for groundwater monitoring either during construction or post-construction, especially in the vicinity of the, the vernal, vernal pool, uh, knowing there have been significant uh, fluctuations in the past and with all the, the grading and everything else going on, I think there might be some, um, some issues there. There hasn't been any discussion as far as we're concerned, I, I guess. There, there is um, monitoring on the site for environmental reasons, um, but not as far as uh, sedimentation. Okay. Do you know if any of the existing um, USGS wells uh, that, that are still functioning, are uh, you gonna try to maintain or are they gonna be a victim of uh, the demolition? No, there are monitoring wells on site and, and some of the, those will be maintained. Okay, that's, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Could you identify those on the plan at some point? We could follow up with a figure of that. Okay. All right. And Josh, I didn't mean to overlook you. Did you have any, any questions? No, not a problem. Uh, I think Joe and Nancy did a great job. Uh, one thing I would mention is, uh, is there a standard for that crushed stone driveway when trucks leave during the deconstruction and construction activities? Track there's you have. Yep, there's a detail of it provided on our plans. Okay, and is there a management plan because those can tend to get filled with dirt and become useless after some amount of time? We'll ensure that there's <clears throat> maintenance language in the SWIP um, so that those will be maintained throughout. Perfect, thank you. Mark, I think we're good. Okay, um, on behalf of CONCOM, um, Bob, do you, would you be opposed to me asking Brittany to draft or provide us a potential or sample order of conditions that they would expect to see to provide us no, I think that's a that's a great idea. It's something we've we've uh, we've been kicking around, and uh, I think uh, that would be uh, quite reasonable. You know, I, I know Brittany, you do this all the time, uh, and I'm, I'm really I don't want this to have the optics of we're letting the fox watch the hen house as much as I I, I recognize that you're a professional, and you probably have a template document, and based on the site. Could you provide us with an order of conditions that you would expect somebody to ask you to comply to? And me saying with the clarity that we're gonna provide that then to EP to give a review and make suggestions to? Yep, I think that's, that's a great idea. Yep. Fair to say, okay. 
And I would yeah. say that we would then, in a metaphorical sense, sit down with Scott Turner and see that everything compares evenly, right? I think it would almost be a literal sense. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that would be great if you could do that. Do you think you could have that in uh, a reasonable time before the next hearing? Yep, we'll do what we can. Cool. Okay. Um, Bob, do you have any other wetland concerns before I move on to uh, some planning board stuff? Uh, nothing that relates to anything we've discussed uh, on tonight's agenda, so I'm good for now. Okay. Um, so, and again, I, I don't want to go through this document too much. I know you said you were going to respond to it. When you do respond to EP's letter, I think in the past you've also been able to add text right under each comment. Would you be providing in the same form, Brittany? Yep, the same form. We'll reiterate his comments and then respond to them. Uh, I think the ones that stand out the most, um, to me anyway, was there was some grading that needed to happen on the adjacent properties. You did touch on that during your presentation. Um, and I think either the planning board would like to see either an easement or some other documentation from those uh, property owners to make sure that you know, they were good with the, those grading requests or, you know, on your plan. Sure. Well, would, would it be acceptable if, you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tyler. No, I was just saying, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, so the way that that originally formulated, the request actually came from the abutting properties because it's it's beneficial to them. And uh, so they approached us uh, with their uh, engineer from Zenith, uh, who's up the road there, uh, and requested that from us. So we've been, Brittany's worked directly with Zenith uh, to compile their existing plans with ours and sort of make the grading work. So I absolutely understood on the request. And so what we were going to do and what I talked with attorney Mather with is that we would provide uh, a letter from them uh, stating that uh, they initiated the request and were actively working uh, with their engineer and our engineer to make that work. Excellent. Yeah. So look, at, that's great. And I, I appreciate that you're doing the good neighbor thing and that there is a lot of cooperation there. Uh, we would like some sort of documentation just to back that up. So, Absolutely understood. Uh, I'm actually going to go backwards a little bit here. Uh, when Sarah French did her presentation, she had uh, mentioned the work in the wetlands to remove the solid waste disposal area would be all handwork. Um, and I assumed that that solid waste dump could be deeper than just surface based. Uh, it seems extreme to just be able to say that uh, that would only be handwork. I, I picture at some point, maybe some grading happened and a, a few things got buried a little bit deeper. And that is kind of one of the things that planning board wants to see is that all cleaned up and I'm sure that the conservation commission as well because of its proximity is so close to the wetlands. Um, I know conservation commission has made conditions to allow equipment to go in or close to the wetlands as long as say hydraulic pistons were uh, filled with uh, vegetable oil rather than hydraulic fluid uh, to make that more doable but to to ensure that all the solid waste was removed. Uh, could you speak to that? I can comment to that and just clarify my comments about that. So what I meant by, um, you know, hand work is, is within the wetland itself, which is a very small sliver. So they will be using equipment, but all of the equipment will be located in upland areas. They won't be able to be driving into the wetland. So they'll be accessing the wetland location from the upland, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's fine. Understood. Yeah. yeah. So you will make an excavation and you will go as deep as you need to go to remove all that. Correct. Um, I know at the last meeting you had 
a certified site professional. I don't remember her name. Uh, I, I think it would be wise for us to condition that she be present to ensure that that location was cleaned, you know, abated properly uh, and be able to be certified by that site professional with documentation to DEP uh, just because it's such a high profile location within the site. Yep, she, she will be the licensed site professional um, for the removal of the entirety of the landfill, um, both in and outside of the wetland. Um, so she will be overseeing all of those activities. Okay. And handling all of the, the DEP permitting. There's a significant amount of permitting with DEP just to, to remove that landfill. So she'll, she'll be handling all of that and will be conducting observations throughout in accordance with DEP's requirements. Okay. And, and upon that conclusion, obviously we'll, we'd like to have some documentation at the town just to ensure that that was included. Okay. Uh, does any planning board member have any comments that they'd like to make? Barbara? Barbara, could you unmute? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I guess my questions are going to direct towards either Scott or Bob from conservation. So either one of you, um, my first question is, you know, we're going to have a wetland scientist that's going to be overseeing this at the expense of the contractor. Um, does the town need to qualify that wetland scientist to make sure that they um, meet the standards we have a very unique community here. We provide water to surrounding communities as well as all the residents. So environmental concerns are pretty significant here. It's, it's different than other communities. So I want to just pose that question to conservation and or Scott, whoever wants to answer that. Could I actually step in on that? Um, yeah. the, the individual that I just mentioned, Barbara, the, the licensed site professional, I actually use the term certified. I think that carries a, a higher badge than a wetland scientist to guarantee the cleanup is that's correct me if I'm wrong, Brittany, but. Yeah, she'll be overseeing everything from a, a contamination perspective um, as far as, you know, removing the landfill. Um, the wetland scientist would really be focused on the direct wetland impact. So just those 500 uh, square feet within the wetlands. Um, but Katie Kudzma, who's the, the licensed site professional, she'll be overseeing um, the removal of, of the, the entirety of the landfill, if that makes sense. So that, okay. that, well, my major uh, that, uh, degree, I guess, of being a licensed site mm -hmm. professional, that I think is what you're looking for or asking for, Barbara, is she has the criteria to do that. Yes, I'm, I'm just wanting to make sure that the, um, that the professional that's being engaged is somebody that we, I guess, you know, is an employee of the contractor or the, or the investor, but is an employee that, you know, is, is it comes from a reputable firm that, that, that the town feels comfortable and our consultant feels comfortable um, relying on about, a, it looks to me like about 20% of the property is covered with a vernal pool. That's pretty significant. So. So could I ask Scott Turner to speak to this please? Yeah. So I think there's really there's a couple of ways that you can handle it. Um, you, you're really talking about what who is the individual that will be out there, I guess, monitoring what is going on. Um, and it, it's not, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm um, I'm wondering if you're asking about hazardous materials or or a wetlands person. Both. Both. So mm -hmm. as I understand the, the LSP rules or the hazardous uh, waste rules, the liability, and, and, and I actually spoke with the president of our company about this um, probably an hour before this hearing, because I thought this might come up and I'm not an LSP, but he is. And he said that, um, and this is my understanding, that you know all an LSP is bound by a different standard than other professionals. And um, they have, 
you know, personal responsibility and liability associated with doing their job properly. So, um, you know, I, asked, I actually asked him that question. Would, does it make sense to have another person on site other than the LSP mm -hmm. kind of looking out for the LSP? And in his opinion, he did not think so because of the, the strict rules and liabilities associated with being a licensed type professional, he did not think that was necessary. With regards to wetland science, I think that that is a, um, you know, with all things, it, it really goes down to the credibility and the professionalism of the person that is out there. Um, and in my experience, there have been projects where the town relies on the licenses and the experience of the people who are representing the developer. And then there are other times where we are asked to go out there and provide inspections. And I'm not saying you have to use us to do this if this is what you decide to do, but um, there are other times when we, we are asked to kind of go out there and do inspections and look out for people on behalf of the town. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if that's the case, then, you know, or I could recommend folks that you could hire um, that are that are wetland scientists. I mean, we we um, we had Brad Holmes from um, ECR engaged on this project because I've worked with him for, for probably 25 years. I used to work with him at a prior firm, and um, as far as I'm concerned, he's one of the most reasonable, level-headed uh, professional people that are out there. So. Um, you know, I have every confidence in him and um, it, it's really at your discretion, I guess, as to whether or not you want to have somebody else that, that is out there. I think the, the impacts to the wetlands are minimal. I, I think that um, I like the fact that from a stormwater perspective, they're infiltrating all the water into the ground. So I think that that certainly minimizes any erosion and sedimentation impacts that could happen. Um, the only concern that I really have is that, you know, with regards to that infiltration basin in the back and um, the one where, where the solid waste disposal area is, you know, these it has been there for a long, long time. And on a lot of state hospital projects, my understanding, and this comes from Paul, our president, in the discussion I had before, the, um, before this meeting, that there have been times where they open those up and there are a lot of surprises. So, um, you know, that is really my, my only concern. But in terms of protecting the wetlands from a stormwater perspective, I think that, you know, the approach that the applicant has taken is good and, and their engineering is sound. And I wouldn't necessarily be, you know, most of the comments that I had were, I would say, um, I don't want to say they're minor, because if I thought they were completely minor, I wouldn't have made them. But um, I think they make the project better. But in terms of the overall approach, and, and the way they've approached the drainage, I think it, it definitely is in the best interest of the wetlands and, and the town. So just to follow up on that, Scott, um, in short, which individual in your opinion would be more important regarding the cleanup of the solid waste disposal area, a licensed site professional or a wetland scientist? A licensed site professional. Thank you. But in terms of restoring the wetlands, you need to have a wetland scientist out there overseeing that to make sure that it's restored properly. Yep, I understood. I, I, I think both should be included. Barbara, you're muted again. There you go. Follow-up question for Scott. Um, one of the comments that was made was talking about the low groundwater at this property. Um, this property is going to have a lot of truck traffic. Um, can you speak to the runoff um, and the impact for the groundwater more for the public than for myself, just because I think there's going to be a lot of concern about runoff. There's an aquifer that I believe under, exists underneath part of this property. Um, and I think truck traffic and runoff from the vehicles would is a concern for the community. So um, in my opinion, as I, as I said a few minutes ago, I think that the approach they take, they've taken in terms of infiltrating most of the water back into the ground is the right one. Um, 
the treatment that they're providing. And to be honest with you, there's no better treatment than infiltrating water through the ground. So um, I think that, you know, they have the proper best management practices to treat water prior to it being infiltrated. Um, from a volume perspective, you know, before, because of the type of soils that are out there, they're, they're A soils, which have a high amount of um, infiltrative capacity before anything was ever built. All the water or the majority of the water infiltrated into the ground. And, and so um, they are restoring the site from a hydro, hydrologic sense um, closer to the natural condition than it is now. So they will be putting more water back into the ground. And I think that the, the treatment is appropriate. To manage the level of trucks that we're talking about, it's 128 days at that property. Yeah, I mean, the, the, right, right for, from, my, I, from my perspective, they're going to, you know, they're going, whatever number of trucks that they have out there, they'll be carrying, you know, they'll be carrying uh, pollutants and solids and, um, Again, the, the treatment that they have, that they propose is consistent with the standards and is, um, will, will, you know, is appropriate. Okay, thank you. I have two more follow-up questions. Um, on the plan, Brittany, there was a reference to a hydro separator. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. Um, it's, uh, it's honestly like a fancy catch basin. Um, so a, a standard catch basin will have a, a deep sump, um, which will collect solids and a hood, which will collect uh, pollutants. But this one actually has an insert um, and allows a swirling factor. So stormwater falls in, it swirls and allows contaminants to settle out into the sump before um, stormwater discharges. Um, and to be clear, the the only impervious area that's getting to that hydrodynamic separator, um, it, it, it's probably about 500 square feet. Um, it's just a very small bottom leg close to Main Street and that, that portion of the site is so low, we, we couldn't get it into the gravel wetland. Um, so it, it, it's, it's just a, a chamber that swirls the stormwater before it, it discharges and allows a little bit more of the, the sediments to settle out. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my last question is for Scott related to um, floods. So we're talking about upsizing on the pipes. And my question is, you know, we've had a lot of flooding here in town. Some of that has been pretty significant. Um, we are a watershed area. So uh, climate change will be uh, happening here, more visible here probably than in other locations, I would presume. How many 25 years floods have we had in the 50 years Um in the past 50 years here in our community, does any, I guess I don't have to direct to the Scott if anybody else knows the answer yeah, to that question. No, yeah. I don't know how many 25 year storms you've had. I mean, there are, there are records and I guess, you know, somebody or myself, if you wanted me to, could go back and look through them. But um, I agree with you that uh, rainfall intensities are increasing. And when they used the, um, when they sized the stormwater system, they used the more advanced stormwater intensity curves that are becoming standard practice as we contemplate climate change. Um, again, the majority of storms, the vast majority of storms in Massachusetts are an inch or lower. An inch, yeah, okay. Yeah. So Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I'd like to point out to Barbara, the thing I always worry about with storms, it's, you know, I don't really worry about the 25 year or even the 50 year. The real problem comes in the spring when you have a 10 year storm, four days later, a 10 year storm, three days after that, a 10 year storm. There's where the real problem comes. And there's just no way you can't engineer for that. And those are the type of things, the type of, of, of rain events that cause the most problems and the most damage. It's not the giant storm that which wreaks a little bit of havoc for 12 hours and then it basically goes away. It's that continuous, you get that rainy season and everything is saturated and there's just no more infiltration anymore. But you can't engineer for it. There's the problem with that. Am I correct with that, Brittany? 
Yeah. And I mean, if, if there's snow cover still and, um, you oh. know, the outlets have, have snow backed up at the outlet, then no matter how big you make the pipes, there, there's yep. nowhere for, for the stormwater yep. to outfall too. Okay. Um, I will clarify that in our long-term operation maintenance plan, that will be something where um, harping on is removing leaf litter, removing snow, you know, ensuring that the catch basins are clear, particularly in the, the spring and the fall when they tend to get covered by um, whether it's leaves or, or snow cover. All right, thank you. Um, Peter, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. Um, mine focus uh, on utilities, and I'd like to know if the, and I'm sure they already have spoken with both the city of Taunton as to the water supply and to Middlebor Middleborough Gas as far as the electric and, and gas. But I'd like to actually see their response and say, yeah, we can support a building that size and we can support it with no interruptions to anybody else. Uh, the water, it, for a building that size, it's not a lot of employees, obviously, but if there was a fire, can they support a fire? Uh, nine hydrants, uh, let's say they had to open four, will it still keep going? So I'd like to hear it from Middleborough to say, yep, it'll do it. Um, I've heard how big the water main is going through the street and that's great, but the, I, you know, nothing speaks volumes like them actually saying it. And uh, as far as the gas goes, if you've been watching the news this past week, everyone knows what utilities failing uh, looks like. So I'd, I'd like to know that the gas main that they're going to tap into can handle heating that building and not disrupt the existing customers that are on that gas. Oh, I'll, I'll take that. Can you can you hear me okay? Am I coming yeah. through clearly? Okay, good. Yeah. I, I have microphone issues all the time, so um, we'll just go through them one by one. So the gas is Eversource, um, and uh, yes, we are working with them. They've confirmed that they can handle the capacity. Again, you know, when we talk about the size of this building, it, it is shockingly low from a utility perspective what it uses. So uh, the gas, albeit a big building and a large gas load, um, I'm going off the top of my head. I want to say it's a uh, million BTU demand or 1.1 um, for the rooftop units. But yes, they have confirmed that and are actively working on a will serve letter for us. Um, so that's gas. On the water, we had a meeting with Taunton Water last week on either Monday or Tuesday. Uh, they confirm that the agent connection is, is what they want, that the fire hydrant spacing is, is within what they want, um, and that they don't have any problem supplying us. So that will serve letter is in progress as well. Uh, your question, though, was more related to sprinklers. So just for reference, it's 6,045 gallons a day. Um, and to put that in perspective of, well, what does that mean? Is that a lot? Is that a little? Um, it's roughly, you know, 60% of what uh, the condo development behind our building is requiring. So it's, it's very minimal. Uh, it's a 17 unit development. In terms of what does that mean for the sprinkler system? So the sprinkler system gets pressurized. So I think to your point, yes, I think if you just connected it and then the sprinklers ran, it wouldn't work. So that they, I think that that's a fair, a fair point. Um, so we have uh, a diesel fire pump that pressurizes a loop around the building. So the hydrants and the sprinklers within the building are connected to one pressurized loop system. And so what that is doing is essentially taking what's coming off the street, um, filling everything with water, pressurizing it so that in the event that it does go off, um, that's essentially what's moving the flow of water to assist what wouldn't regularly be enough. And that's, that's a pretty standard item um, for buildings of this size. Uh, and it's something that we did. Brittany came on, uh, as well as our uh, builder, Arco, who was on an earlier presentation, discussed with the fire chief. Um, so we've definitely talked about those items with him. Uh, and then um, I think that was your only two. You had gas. Um, did you want to talk about electrical? I don't know, but you had, you had water and gas. That's where we're, where we're currently at with those. But I'm, I'm happy to, uh, and I'll make sure that I provide the well-served letters. Um, if you wouldn't mind just... If you had a comment on electric while we're on the subject, Tyler. Yeah, yeah, so the, yeah, this is this is the MGED one. Uh, so it's an interesting circuit uh, because of, I don't know how many years ago, but it's called five to 10 years ago. It's been a lot of solar uh, arrays that are, are, 
are powering uh, parts of this grid. They're actually up to 65% renewable energy on this on this particular um, on this particular area. So it's, it's interesting from that perspective. I just thought it was an interesting thing to note. But um, they basically are operating at almost the absolute capacity that they have uh, for this particular area. So they jokingly were, were saying thank you. Like we need to take some power with this thing to allow some more room to expand our renewable. Um, so, you know, the point is that there's beyond more than enough. We're going to be looking for about 4,000 amps, which equates to about 1,000 amps per 100,000 square feet, which is, again, another, another kind of typical industrial standard. Thank you. That's it for me, Mark. Thank you. That's good. Uh, Michelle, do you have any comments or questions? Oh, no, not tonight. I think I'm good. Thank you. Okay. And Jack, do you have any questions? I had three. Uh, Brittany, could you just quickly, in layman's terms, explain to me what a HydroCAD model is? Talks about the piping over on one uh, page. Five. I'll do my best, but Scott, feel, feel free to chime in. Um, it's the it's the the modeling system that the industry it's the industry standard modeling system that we use um, to model. Uh, hydrologic systems. Um, so what essentially what we do is we identify our various design points. So those are the, the locations where stormwater discharges off of our site. Um, it allows us to put in representative catchment areas. Um, so we, we delineate the, the size of the area discharging to each of those design points and we assign it a cover type. So if it's impervious, that assumes most of the stormwater runs quickly off of the site to the design point. Whereas if it's you know a wooded, a soil type material, it would assume most of that stormwater infiltrates. Mm -hmm. Um, so that HydroCAD modeling system allows us to model those subcatchments and it also both in existing and proposed conditions, as well as a, a model the ponds that we're proposing um, mm. to help us analyze the, the, the peak rates of stormwater runoff from existing Great. to proposed. Thank you, Brittany. Yep. You know, Tyler, I had two questions, but I think Stephen has already raised them. It was, has Middleborough and Taunton been apprised of the project and that they can meet the water demand needs of this property. And I think you are, you've already addressed that, but then also the other one I was gonna ask is, you know, is, uh, is the Middleborough or, and or Taunton gonna be able to handle the water pressure needed for the hydrants uh, at, these, at these particular, this particular property? And I think you've answered that, Tyler, correct? Yeah. You spoke to, uh, you were addressing- That diesel pump you had mentioned, Tyler? That, that's, that's correct. The pressurized fire loop and that supplies the in-building sprinkler system as well as the fire hydrants outside the building. So tell it, Taunton and Middleborough are aware of this project and what I, the needs are going to be for the water for these, this project, right? That's correct. The water is going to be coming from Taunton, but during that meeting I was referencing last week, Middleborough was also present uh, to confirm that there was no issues with that or what was in the street or any sort of cross lines and so there was there was a, a long conversation between the two uh and forgive me for the term i'm using but water managers from each town uh they did meet on site and discuss that so yes they're both aware but the water is, is coming from Taunton. great thank you thank you that's all i have all right at this time i'd like to ask if any other uh, abutters or people present have questions. Uh, if you do, please hold your hand up. And again, the questions would be related to uh, stormwater management, erosion control, uh, buffer zone, septic utilities, grading, and wetlands. Uh, and again, if you're not on video, I can't see your hand. So I will assume I that you don't have a question. question. I'm sorry, I'd like to ask a question. This, all right, this could you Janet state Scott. your name and address? Yes, my name is Janet Scott. I'm at 9 Rush Pond Road in Lakeville. Go right ahead. I, thank you. Um, I did want to ask, um, I appreciate the fact that uh, the, the boards, the various boards are asking the items and the, the concerns in terms of safety and environmental and I'm very, I, I really appreciate that. They're taking care of those aspects for me, but I'm hoping that you won't mind if I ask Brittany. Um, Brittany, I, I noticed with some of the visuals that you provided earlier that um, 
not only the um, septic system, but um, the, the stormwater sites, one of the stormwater sites, and certainly the septic systems were located directly near the Rush Pond. And um, I was curious if you might be able to, to help me understand how will those two systems appear from the Rush Pond side? And if you would be able, if, if the company will be able to camouflage those systems as you have planned for areas behind the houses, um, you know, to, to kind of camouflage things with uh, berms and trees and shrubbery and so on. Will that be able to happen with the, um, the septic system and, the, and the, um, the other septic site, or not the septic system, but the stormwater site that was mentioned in one of your visuals? Sure. Um, so the, the septic system, and this is the unfortunate thing about being a civil engineer, is that everything I do gets buried underground and nobody can see it. Um, so <laughs> the, the septic system will be, the entirety of it will be completely underground and it will be entirely within the pavement of the loading dock. So honestly, the employees that work there won't even know it's there. Um, so so you, you as an abutter certainly would not know that the septic system is there. Um, just like at a residential house, you, you know, most folks don't even know that they're outside playing in their yard on top of their septic system. Um, as far as the stormwater system, it is a, it's a basin. It's at a very low point of the site. Um, and it's, it's a vegetated basin. So it, again, that's something that just looks like a, a low point of a site that you, you likely see at sites all around you know, as you, you go out in around town, um, but it, it's just vegetated, it's grass, there's plantings. Um, however, that one in the rear, it, it's surrounded by woods on all sides. I don't think that that's anything any abutter would be able to see. Um, and they wouldn't discern it from the, the wooded areas surrounding it. And okay. just to, to uh, help to clarify and add to Mrs. Scott's points, Brittany, the, the distance that those septic systems are from Rush Pond or anyone else are, I know you, you mentioned from the wells, but they're more than a suitable distance allowable by Board of Health and state standards from those entities. Correct, yep. They're all uh, outside of the 100 foot buffer zone from Rush Pond Road, uh, Rush, Rush Pond, excuse me. And, and for clarity, um, I know the septic system, when we looked at it tonight in the visual for somebody who doesn't look at them all the time, it looks like two giant buildings, but in essence, it's just two fields that are buried. How far underground are those? Because they're actually under the pavement area and trucks can drive over them. Correct. Uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but I, I would, I would say between one to three feet um, under underground is, would be the top of the system. Okay. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Ms. Scott? It does, and I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so again, does anybody else have any questions? Anybody? I do. Mary Murphy. I see Mary Murphy. Yes. See your hand up. Hi, yes, Laurie Link. Um, I was wondering, are, are all these special um, safeguards and stuff going to be in, codified in the special permit? I'm sorry, could you repeat uh, that a little bit louder? It's tough to get stuff to hear you. Are all the safeguards that we're discussing regarding everything, that's all going to be codified in the special permit for the project, correct? I, I would say most likely. Uh, um, if you could speak to one specifically, I could probably answer it better. Well, I, it's a generalized question because I know you, we're only discussing certain things and I'm, it's kind of going back to all of the other. Parts. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, I, I guess I hope this answers your question, but the, the, the point of every one of these separate meetings is for the planning board or any of these other boards to gain facts. And so, yeah, we're taking notes every meeting and basically we're writing down conditions based on the discussion that we can then condition the project to make it safer and more palatable and better for the town and the abutters. Uh, 
Will so, that be presented to the town prior to final approval or no? Um, I can't say procedurally exactly how that's going to play out, but um, I guess we don't know. I mean, I don't want to say that. I don't know the outcome. You know, I, I can't say that, that the other four people are going to vote a certain way because I don't know because we don't discuss that. But I guess if it's as neutral as possible that I can answer the question. If I was to assume an outcome and or say hypothetically there was going to be an outcome and it was for approval, it would be with conditions and it would be with conditions from every hearing that we've had hmm. from hearing number one through hearing number seven. Hmm. Okay, all right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I also uh, add some information on inspections as well? Yeah, go ahead, Tyler. So uh, the, the question asked has come up a few times just about conditioning and things of that nature. And I, I do want to take uh, a step back and, and for the topics we're discussing tonight, which are relative to all the other things, is that uh, there's inspection processes that occur for every single part of the project from a number of different agencies. Um, aside from any conditions that the planning board or the town may apply. So, for example, tonight a lot of what we talked about was uh, grading utilities, um, um, stormwater management, and those types of things, which all get uh, inspected by the town uh, building inspector before they get covered up. Additionally, and in almost all cases, uh, the, the local building inspector will request additional engineering sign-offs. So that would be another uh, engineering group, uh, likely VHB, um, to sign off on that. So you have a trail of documentation with all this underground stuff from uh, an engineering firm as well as the local building inspector. Uh, and then in regards to some of the wetlands items and, and, and uh, SWDA that we were talking about, those are all regulated by the DEP. Um, and those are set regulations set forth by the state. So the point of what I'm getting at isn't, isn't to explain every single inspection that happens. It's more just to state that regardless of conditions put forth, every single item, whether it's the building, underground, stormwater, SWDA, you name it, wetlands, has its baked in regulatory process from mm -hmm. the town and the state already. Barbara? Mark? Um, I'd like to just address Mary's question as well, more from a layperson, which is that to say that when we um, have our next year, when we have the hearings that continue, you, the public will be available, you know, able to hear the conditions that we will be listing off. So whatever mm -hmm. conditions may be requested as a condition of the approval will be communicated in a public forum. Okay. The other thing I'd like to say about that is if the public has specific concerns, they should be directing those. I think Mark to Michelle is that she's our, she's our point person for any questions. We definitely want to welcome feedback from the, uh, the public. We have a lot of really smart people out there. And if there's questions or concerns that we have not addressed, we would like to hear from the public on those matters. Thank you. With that in mind, could I ask one more question? Is that Janet Scott? This is Scott. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there again, yeah, I am um, considering uh, what um, Mary talked about because I think it is very important for all of us who live all around this uh, potential um, project. Because I noted when we looked at the um, Development Opportunities District that it does say that the special permit would be with safeguards and conditions to prevent de detrimental effects. And, and so far, as I've listened to the various meetings, I've heard such things as um, no refrigeration. Um, these are things that just were mentioned. No refrigeration, no truck use on Bridge Street, no trucks turning left onto Route 79, no trucks going on 105 through Middleborough to the Route 44, um, truck activity at night being restricted yep. to Mrs. the- Mrs. Scott. I, I, these are all things that it, were talked about. Th those are things that have all been talked about and they're all serious parts of what we would consider for conditions. 
certainly. And I and I just wanted to make sure that I knew that these were things you were considering. But the important thing I think for people like Mary and myself and many other people around is how do we know um, as a surrounding resident who would be the contact person and the responsible party to address um, the infraction of the conditions that are listed with the permit. How's that going so, to work? Um, so let's just say hypothetically, if there's an issue with noise, yes? Yes, sure. Okay, so I believe that that would be reported to the Board of Health because they handle noise uh, pollution and noise complaints. Mm. But then the, would the Board of Health be taking care of that or would the owners of the property or the tenant because well, it all, it's all contingent on the special permit. So if they violated it, they're in violation of the special permit. So I, I, I would have to assume at that point, the uh, zoning enforcement officer would go out and probably give them some sort of a cease and desist until said violation was rectified. Okay. Barbara, do you have a question? I, I do. I, I just want to compliment you, Mark. I mean, I called you the other day to compliment you about this, but I think it's really important for the community to have some appreciation from the amount of time that's going into this project. Um, you know, I spent, I, I was expecting, I dedicated a couple of hours the other day going back through my notes of meetings that we've had recently um, to make sure I sort of had everything in order. Um, Mark Knox has done an outstanding job and there wasn't anything in my notes that was missed. Um, so I just want to assure everybody that we are paying very close attention um, to these conditions. And we, I think we're all on the same page for what we want to see for our community. And we're very fortunate to have a developer who is being very receptive and cooperative and responsive. So um, I encourage everybody to participate with the public hearings like Janet is, the things you've lifted off. Um, you know, I don't want to speak to them specifically, but it is, you know, you, you're, you're paying attention and I appreciate that. And I think it contributes a lot to the town. So stay tuned and make sure you participate in the, in the follow-up hearings. Okay. Yeah. And Mrs. Scott, it, it sounded like you were reading from a list and I'm not being a wise guy with that. Send your list to Michelle McEachran. I know. Okay. I know your husband has her contact information. Please send it to okay. her and we, we will take that under advisement. You, you may have sure. listed something we've over, overlooked and we don't want to do that. Mark? Well, it, I've just tried to, um, you know, listen to the meetings and, and, uh, and keep track of the kinds of things people talk about. So I certainly will send a list to her. Thank you. Thank you. Jack, do you have a question? Mark, I'd just like to make one comment uh, in, in maybe speaking to Mrs. Scott or any of the abutters. In my opinion, I think Rhino has done a fabulous job with all of their consultants and engineers in addressing all of our concerns uh, throughout all of these different uh, meetings that we've had. I think they've done a, a very good job in trying to be attentive and listening to and addressing every one of their issues. Thank you, Jack. Okay. Um, I agree with that. Uh, so I just, I have a comment from Facebook. Uh, Leanne Barton Bradley had a, uh, have additional comments, responses been submitted since public hearing in January, which addressed traffic, uh, which I know we have some of those I received yesterday. Uh, and it, we probably can provide some of those in the next couple of days. I don't think that, uh, have all of them gone to VHB? Yeah, I think the most recent letter went to. Are you talking about the warehouse use? Actually, well, the recent peer review didn't really touch traffic. It was uh, the trip calculation one and the ENF, EENF had some comments to traffic, which is not from VHB or uh, environmental partners. So there is some additional information that we could probably circulate to Leanne Bradley, uh, either tomorrow or Monday, Michelle. 
Sure. You're talking about that, um, the warehouse use trip generation from EP? Yeah, we had that. And also there was the, uh, I think it was the MEPA report that we had in our packet, the 108 page document from MassDOT. Right. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. If Middleborough hasn't received it, I thought that they did send that to Middleborough as well. Maybe, I, maybe. I and she's just looking for additional. So yeah. um, I, I would say we could probably circulate those things. Um, and so just keeping on track here, moving on. If there are no other comments, I'd like to make a motion to continue this public hearing until March 4th at 7 p.m. And for discussion, uh, Brittany, if you could, would like to be able to discuss uh, a draft order of conditions. Uh, I would like to have a brief discussion on the traffic and the trip generation stuff that we have uh, at that meeting. And then if there are any other looming questions that we have between now and then, we'll try and put them on the agenda. Okay. So um, motion to continue until March 4th at 7 p.m. for this public hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second for the planning board. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna take a roll call vote. Barbara? Aye. Peter? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Jack? Aye. Myself. So motion carries. The public hearing will continue until March 4th. Um, at this point, Chairman Bouchard, would you like to make a motion to continue the Conservation Commission hearing until March 4? So moved. Do okay. I have a second? I second that. Okay. In favor, Joseph? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Mark? Aye. Josh? Aye. Myself. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, so I think that concludes tonight's business. Uh, Chairman Bouchard, would you like to adjourn ConCom's meeting tonight? Yes, I move that we adjourn. We I'll second. second that. I second it. Okay. In favor, uh, John, uh, Joseph. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Josh. Aye. Mark. Aye. And myself, I motion carries. All right, so conservation commission has adjourned. And at this time, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn tonight's planning board meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, Barbara? Aye. Peter? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Jack? Aye. Myself, aye. The motion carries. That concludes tonight's business, and we will see everybody on March 4th at 7 p.m. Thank you.